Welcome everyone to this session entitled Sustainable, Building Sustainable Digital Finance for All. I would like all of you, if you could possibly put in your name and where you come from in the chat uh, function, uh, also your organization, so we can really see and explore how truly global uh, this conversation is. And also you are invited, because we want this to be as participatory as possible, to also throughout this hour, put in your questions, reflections, and anything you want to share around what's being discussed in the chat. And then we will get back to you, or I will, towards the end of the session for more of an interactive uh, dialogue. So today we have with us an esteemed set of panelists to discuss today's topic. Today's topic is really how can people's choices um, affect and be empowered to become greener so they also can become part of creating a nature positive future and a net zero pathway towards a safe and decarbonized future. And we have with us, as you see, the composition of the panel is maybe somewhat new and innovative. We have a large digital wealth management platform. We have a mobile payment platform. We have a consumer advocate and we have a bank. And that is exactly because we need to innovate this conversation to design new types of solutions. And that is exactly what these people are doing and what they're capable of sharing with you today. Because with new types of digital capabilities, we can actually give each and every one of us individualized green feedback real time. So like you have a Fitbit, you can now just get it for green on your mobile payment platform. You can get a green user journey so that your savings does not become invested into something you don't know or into not building a sustainable future and into really building it. And we will hear also from a bank how it's empowering actually farmers to become part of the solutions through carbon markets. And we will hear from a consumer advocate on how consumer rights can be protected in the process. So all of this we will explore over the next hour. My name is Marianne. I'm the executive director of the Green Digital Finance Alliance, and I have the pleasure to navigate us all through this conversation. During the first 45 minutes, it will be mainly a dialogue and question answer session with our panelists. And for the last 20 to 15 minutes, we will open up for dialogue uh, with each and every one of you who indicates in the chat. So let me turn to even unpack more our four panelists and introduce them properly to you. So we have um, Martina Jensen uh, with us today. She's head of partnerships at Rabobank. Here she is leading a new initiative with Rabobank to stimulate the transition of small scale farmers to agroforestry by certifying, monitoring and marketing carbon sequestration at scale. A marketplace is, is created to link the farmers to corporates wishing to offset their carbon emissions with high quality traceable credits. Prior to this, Martini worked for Rabo Foundation as program manager, providing high risk loans to farmer based organizations. We also have Wan Yang, who is the um, working for FNZ. She is the head of strategic partnership sustainability APEC. FNZ is a global technology partner for pension funds, banks, insurance companies. And prior to FNZ, Wan Yang, she spent 14 years as relationship manager, serving high net worth individuals at two Swiss banks. Then I also have the pleasure to introduce to you um, Georgia Carpetko, Ka Program and Project Manager. She holds a PhD in public administration, having researched social inequalities and public policy. She has been working at EDEC for four years uh, today as a program manager. And before she was an officer at the Open Source Center for the US government, a university professor, among other things. And last but not least, we have Felix Sharif, who is head of corporate relations at Dana Indonesia, which is one of Indonesia's largest digital wallets. Felix has served in a number of public and private sector roles and holds a university degree in international relations. Now I have the pleasure uh, to invite our panelists uh, to start uh, discussing. But before that, I will just uh, invite all of us to listen to Peter Andrews of Consumers International to highlight 
the consumer vision for fair digital finance, especially focusing on the sustainable finance pillar. Over to you, Peter. Thank you, Marianne. A warm welcome to everyone joining from around the world. This session is part of a week of impact oriented events for our Fair Digital Finance Forum to amplify our celebrations for World Consumer Rights Day, which takes place every year on March the 15th. Now, throughout this week, we've already had uh, incredible conversations bringing together voices from civil society, businesses and government. And the week has also given us the opportunity to promote three key initiatives at Consumers International. Firstly, our new three-year programme to strengthen the voice of underrepresented, uh, underrepresented consumers in digital finance policy making and product design. And this is our Fair Digital Finance Accelerator. We've also launched a global buy now, pay later statement, which has been endorsed by consumer advocates across the world. And as Marianne mentioned, we've also launched a consumer vision for fair digital finance. Now, our vision is that digital financial services can empower consumers everywhere. To achieve this, digital financial services must be inclusive, safe, data protected and private and sustainable. And it's this sustainable theme that we are focusing on in the, in the discussions today. Uh, hopefully you will have seen our vision. You can find it on our website. But for sustainable finance, we're really looking for communities to have a home to live for and a financial future to save for. We believe that digital financial services drive climate finance and incorporate environmental impact considerations into all decisions. Sustainability impact should be communicated to consumers and net zero aligned financial services should be the default option uh, offered to consumers. I'm really looking forward to the discussions uh, in this session. So thank you very much for your time and please do post any questions and comments you have in the chat. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter, for sharing this and also for giving a perfect segue into what is really the first theme we will explore today, which is around data barriers. So you talked about that consumers are entitled to get the information they need on the carbon footprint and nature footprint of their actions, but also that we should have green default options. So let's start on giving this information to consumers that relies essentially on data. So let me turn to you, Georgia, to ask you, to help us understand what are some of the challenges we are facing from the consumer perspective in getting access to this green data. Hello, everyone. So first, I would like to thank you for inviting me to speak at this session. My name is Georgia. I'm program manager at IDEC. IDEC is a consumer association in Brazil that active for consumer guidance, mobilization, publish, publishing research and studies that bring evidence for the advancement and improvement of public policies and collectively legal actions. So Brazil is a country with more than 212 million, 12 million inhabitants. So I would like to bring here some of the challenges that we face when we want to reflect and push forward the construction of sustainable digital finance for all. However, I think it's worth mentioning that although I'm going to present here some numbers and issues concerning Brazil, they reflect the situation of many countries in the global south. So Brazil is a country that concentrates approximately 60% of the Amazon rainforest. This area of the Brazilian Amazon alone is home to more than 20 million people just in Brazil, including hundreds of thousands of indigenous people. And the region has 67% of the world's tropical forests and displays an essential role in helping to control the planet's climate. So, but in addition, Brazil at the same time coexists daily with the dichotomy of a very vulnerable population, especially in these regions, and the threat of predatory exploitation ventures, not all concerning with environmental and climate issues. So for you to have an idea of the difficulty of the situation of Brazilian population, which has worsened a lot with the COVID pandemic and economic crisis, today more than 85 million people are hungry or in food insecurity. There is 41% of our population today. So I make this quick diagnosis of our current situation to establish that we live in this duality we are very rich in a strategic resource for climate change at the same time that we have a population that often does not have enough to eat or access to basic services such as electricity and sanitation. 
So when we talk about sustainable digital finance for all and about the challenges for consumer, we it's important to take this context into, into account. So thank you so we, much, Georgia. I think that was really good to have that context setting of also of, of what are consumers, the real constraints they are operating in from a Brazilian perspective. That is really valuable. I want to turn also just to you, Martina, really quickly, and then to Wan Yang and uh, to Felix on sharing with us what are your main data challenges to give your clients this green feedback. Martina? Yeah, so thank you uh, for having the opportunity to uh, um, be part of this panel. Uh, my name is Martina. I work for Rabobank for a new initiative where we uh, try to generate an additional income stream for farmers making the transition to a more regenerative practice, uh, specifically agroforestry. Um, and we do that by, in a scalable manner, connecting them to the voluntary carbon market, trying to significantly reduce the cost of monitoring and certification, and by cr uh, creating transparency so that corporates looking to offset their emissions after they first reduced uh, can do that by purchasing high quality credits. And in order to come um, to a very uh, scalable solution, um, digitization is very important. So um, we look to onboard farmers onto the platform and for that we need high quality data, right? And working with smallholder farmers in uh, the countries that we work with in Africa, Latin America and Asia, um, is something that um, is sometimes a, a challenge because the data is not there, but also because it seems that for a lot of different projects, um, similar data is being used, but not exactly the same. So what we see oftentimes is that when we try to onboard the farmers, we require slightly different data than what was available already. And as a result, sometimes the people need to go back in the field, which is very uh, time consuming and costly to collect data again. So we try to really match that to other systems. Um, but I, I think one thing that could really help is if we can all unite and make sure that we have clear definitions on the type of data that we use so that we can create efficiencies there. Um, Thank you so much, Martina. That was really spot on that we need data standards and interoperability. Uh, of the data. Can I just quickly turn to you, Wan Yang, with the same question from a wealth management, dif digital wealth management perspective. What are some of, what is your key data challenge for green data? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Marianne, and good evening to everyone here from Singapore. It's a pleasure to be with you. Um, just, just as a very short background to who, uh, for those who are perhaps less familiar with FNZ, we're an end-to-end -end technology and operations partner to some of the world's asset owners and managers. To date, we administer about 1.5 trillion in assets. That roughly equates to 1% of global AUM. So just to um, give you sort of like an understanding of, of the scale that we're working with. So when it comes to data, why, why data is important for, especially with, we went live last November with our latest product called FNZ Impact. So what FNZ Impact aims to do is to create a second revolution in investment management by providing global citizens and their advisors an overlay of ESG data and analytics on their portfolio. So rather than just, you know, basing a success of, a, of an investment portfolio with your financial performance, um, it's, it's not just financial, it's also because you take into consideration environmental and societal. Um, when it comes to data, you know, we, we use data source from TrueCost, UN Global Canopy, Sustainalytics, MSCI, just, uh, you know, all, all, many, many different third-party data providers and Morningstar, Util. And a key attribute of this proposition is to really aggregate all these providers and move away move away from proprietary third party rankings so that we can really get, um, because there's very little sort of, there's very little alignment when it comes to how different parties rate each company. There's no, there's no true sort of uniformity as, 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 our, as other panel members here have discussed. So we are looking beyond scores to underlying data. And then this approach adheres to the commitment, you know, to, towards dissemination of actual reported and measurable impact data in the areas where this data is most prevalent and available. 
So um, by aggregating all this information, we are hoping to provide a higher level of transparency for, for disclosure of key sustainability metrics. But in saying all of this, we have to come back to the notion that we are talking about a retail investment product. So while institutional investors really like data and have the engine to you know, digest very a lot of complexity, when you're, when you're presenting this to a retail end user, you really have to simplify it. It has to be, you know, click, 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 action. Um, and so that, that, that's something that we are always um, taking into consideration when we design, even, even in the face with all this complexity and lack of, lack of coherence in, in, in data. Thank you so much, Wan Yang. That was really a great additional point. So we need data that is interoperable, that is standardized, where, where we can have one profile per person or per product, and that we also need to simplify it so we can explain it in an engaging way to people to go green, that it's not a boring sort of just uh, data and uh, analytics exercise, but it's, 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 it's engaging. So now let's shift from the barriers uh, and outlining those to some of the solutions. And we are very pleased to, uh, to share with you that last year together with quite a number of the panelists, we launched what is called the Every Action Count Initiative or Coalition which is 15 of the largest platforms uh, in the world that congregated around a shared pledge to empower 1 billion uh, green champions to green their lifestyles uh, through green awareness and green action by 2025. And now I would like to turn to one of the members, Felix Sharif uh, of Dana, to ask you, because you are into very practically actually, already delivering on trying to bring people into greening their lifestyles. You have been running or are running pilots on plastics in Indonesia, engaging people. Can you explain to us what you are doing in this pilot work? Of course, uh, happy to explain about it. And thank you very much, Marianne. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Felix Sharif, uh, the head of government relations at Dana Indonesia, one of the leading uh, digital wallet uh, platform in Indonesia. So when we speak about digital wallet, we speak about the payment system and I think it's a jargon all over the world, the payment system. It's always been the backbone of every economy and uh, echoing to what Marian uh, has been said before about digitalization is something that is important and it cannot be hindered by everyone else at the moment, especially when we're reflecting how we're going to respond to the pandemic and how we're going to uh, shape the governance of our economic uh, after this. And of course, one of the things that we deem most important is how we go with sustainability. It's no longer a jargon. It's no longer a matter of strategy that we put in our textbook in every corporate. That's something that we need the most in every solution of the society. And back then, as we know that digital wallet play such a significant role in transforming the small enterprises in Indonesia, the, our customer, especially during the pandemic then, we see a gradual shifting in our society on how they're becoming more digital. And we see that is as a solution when we integrate the payment system that is digital to one of the core problem in, uh, in Indonesia, which is waste management. Waste management is not always about talking about plastic and how we end up in the in the oceans, but it's always a matter of economic problem where we want to interfere from the beginning of its problem until like to the end of the solution. And how to do that? We have a small piloting project that we work with the gov we work with the local government, we work with the central government, and the most important thing is we work with the local community. It's located in the one of the seven wonders in the world in the Borobudur Temple, because we want to make sure when the tourists come to that place later after board, the border is opening in here and still talking about economy, we want to make sure that sustainability is part of our uh, economic solution. We work with the community, we shift the way that the people there doing their waste management uh, we digitalize them. We're trying to make sure that everyone can contribute for the uh, waste payment in a very digital way, and we give them incentive. Because uh, of course, all for the world, we have some limitation, including who are not the uh, who are who are in the digital native. So we're trying to make sure that every non-digital native they are understand about the solution and giving them a gimmick on how to make sure they are comply with everything. So after running almost three months with the piloting and we 
uh, here a very good news that 99% of our intervention is working there. So there are 170 households and everyone is already integrated. They can pay very seamlessly. And we received the acknowledgement by the center, also the local government, and we're ready to uh, expand the project to, to other islands in four cities. Uh, later by the end of this March. So wish us luck on that. And I think uh, this is like the important thing when we talk about waste management and how it can contribute to a better and sustainable economic solution. We should integrate all of the stakeholders involved in here and how we can really bring digitalization to its core and how the uh, digital payment can really solve this kind of problem or become a solution. Thank you this. so much. Thank you so much, Felix. And also for, for, for showing concretely how you're working as a digital platform and a digital wallet for making people part of not only uh, the climate, but also the nature solution with plastics being a major uh, driver of biodiversity loss and how you're doing that concretely. And also shifting from it all being a data problem to it also being an incentive problem because people also need to be incentivized. It's not only call for moral arguments. And, and for this, I would like also to turn to Martine um, from Rabobank, because um, you joined this initiative as Rabobank. So one, one good question, of course, is, is why should others join this type of initiative? And also with your small scale farmer work, how are you building in incentives for the farmers to be, to be part of this work? Yeah, thanks a lot. So, um... There, there's indeed two sides of this, right? So on the one hand side, we have the corporates looking to offset their emissions. And we think that with this proposition, we're offering um, a, a high quality uh, offsetting solution to corporates, uh, whereby I find it very important to say that we only work with corporates who are first looking to offset or reduce their emissions and there needs to be a written policy in place. So either subscribing to SBTI or having another policy in place uh, to, to outline uh, reduction policies, but then to offset the remainder and more and more luckily we see that corporates are very much um, um, looking, for, uh, looking for high quality offsetting, meaning that um, they want to ensure that there's traceability of what they're doing. They're oftentimes looking for ex post solutions, so actual sequestration or actual reduction that takes place in the same year as the emission has been taking place. So what we're focusing on is allowing that. So trans transparency all the way to the individual farmers, making sure there's a, there's a framework ensuring that the, uh, the credits are high quality. So we think that with that, Corporates looking to offset remaining emissions um, uh, hopefully can join us to uh, to pay a fair price for that. And on the on the corp on the smallholder side, um, we hope to to really generate a, a high scalable solution. And with that, that more money is flowing back to the farmers because we see in a lot of cases all of the money that uh, that is uh, kind of received or or uh, generated is then paid for certification and, and monitoring. So we try to innovate there so that at least 80% of the carbon price flows back to the, to the farmers. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Martine. And, and I would like to take this back to you, Wan Yang, in terms of, of, of both a digital wallet and how they, they use that to engage citizens and how a bank is using farmers, engaging farmers, using real incentives, like real monetary incentives to get them engaged. How are you working on your digital wealth platform also to engage some of your users more in the, in the nature positive agenda or the nature transition agenda? Yeah, thanks for that question, Marianne. So um, this is, is actually how do we incentivize our investors to do the right thing is, is, is coming back again to the simplicity. I mean, everyone wants to do the right thing, but when you actually measure the behavior of what is actually happening, the, the, the gap between intention and behavior is, is very large. If not, one might even say it's, it's widening. So we have to go back to this. Um, you know, in fact, just last month, a research published by Make My Money Systemic and Global Canopy report that more than 300 billion um, pounds of UK pension money is invested in companies and financial institutions exposed to high diversity 
deforestation risk. You ask any pension saver, 77% of them would be like, no, I do not want to be invested in this, right? But then what are they actually doing? So it, it really comes back to the simplicity of the solution. Um, when, when, the, when an investor is looking at their, at their portfolio, all this information needs to be digested in a very easy, easy manner. And, and, and the comparability, therefore the data and the compar comparability of sort of the fund solutions, what they can then switch out of and switch into, that, that has to be very, very simple. And for them to be able to understand all of them, you know, so we work a lot with data visual visualization so that you can see sort of how your, how your portfolio is doing against a benchmark according to your three preferences. So you can pick any any three. For now, we are, we're offering our end investors three preferences that you can pick between sort of water scarcity, air pollution, women in leadership, um, deforestation, biodiversity, and climate change, for example. Um, and, and then ideally, you get to the point where it becomes so easy for you to understand then you compare the funds. And if you want to do something better, we make this information very easy for you to then switch into the funds that, that can help you um, help you create a portfolio in your terms that's better because this is very subjective once again. Everyone has very different views on what, what makes a better world. And, and this has to be a very personal and very simple solution. Um, we're also working we are also working towards, you know, the voluntary carbon um, market. We would like to be able to, you know, offer carbon offset. So there again, once again, you have this incentivization problem. How do we turn an investor into an altruist in their journey? Because then effectively you are taking money from your cash account to then offset, you know, your carbon footprint. So you don't want to have a situation where you're having concessionary performance because you decide to be a good global citizen. So how do, how do we, how do we implement all of this? This is this is work in progress, and we are definitely engaging um, with you know every action counts with UN with yourselves, and we're also keeping def yourself, Marianne, and Vian, um, global head of sustainability at FNZ, are part of the expert task force for the you know nature related financial disclosures. So I understand that the beta beta pilot phase uh, beta framework has come out this month. Um, and we're, we're definitely keeping in touch with all the leading bodies to make sure that we're always well informed and then we can translate this into a simple solution for our end users. Brilliant. Thank you, Wan Yang. I would like to now turn to Georgia. Now we've heard about how each of these actors are working with consumers to make them more aware and also incentivize them to then opt for greener options. From your perspective, from the consumer advocacy community, how, how, what other channels do we need to use to make consumers more aware? And what do we need to be aware of while making them aware from a consumer's rights perspective? Thank you, Marianne. So at IDEC, we, we believe that we have a very important role to play in bringing information to people so they can make better choice and also press for the improvement of market policies, either through regulation that really works or directly pressing financial institutions for best practice. So we have some initiatives that we highly value like Fair Finance International, an international civil society network with over hundred organization partners that seek to strengthen the commitment of banks and other financial institutions to social, environmental and human rights is human rights standards through a unified methodology used to evaluate and rate the public do documents of the bank on their ESG commitments, resulting in a score for each bank that's widely publicized and we can put pressure to increase commitment on ESG policies. However, we face an, an environment of lack of information and transparency. Consumers often do not know where their money is being invested and what the impacts are on the environment and not for other consumers. For example, we recently had a study with the support of Fair Financial International, Ops and Ovid, that showed that a bank operating in Brazil finances, a supposedly green company, which produces eucalyptus monocultures in the Jequitinhonha Valley, but which has a great impact on the environmental and on local populations who live daily with the water scarcity caused by such production. And most likely the majority of consumers who put their savings in their in this bank are unaware of the effects of their investments. So we believe that measures that reduce information asymmetry and bring transparency have the potential to empower consumers to make better choice. However, as a consumer association, we know from a lot of research that we should just leave the burden to people. 
In a context of so much inequality and misinformation, we also need to press for more effective regulation that puts the environmental and people first. I will remember that the most vulnerable are the ones who suffer from most from the most from climate change. So in other words, just to conclude, we believe that consumers have the power weapons to press for best practice with accountability and transparency. But we also believe that this process can be faster with regulation and the commitment of those organizations to improve by practice and policies as a whole. Thank you so much, uh, Georgia, and also for segueing perfectly into the next question and round of discussion, which is really around now we've heard what each of you are either doing or thinking or your practices individually. Now it's more to the enabling environment. Uh, so it would be really good to hear your reflections around what are the main regulatory barriers to really empower consumers to shift to greener lifestyles and get that green information they need. Just a few regulatory barriers that you in the short term would like to see lifted for you to properly scale this new collaboration. Uh, with consumers. I'll turn the word first to you, Felix. Uh, thanks a lot for such an interesting uh, question on that. Actually, that's something that we discuss in the morning with the regulator. So uh, one of the way when we listen to our uh, consumer in particular and how when we conduct a consultation with the local community, incentive is not always the amount of money that we give in to the people. But it's as if it could be also the way for them to shift their economic behavior. What I'm trying to say is that, yes, there are a lot of plastics in our neighborhood. Yes, there are a lot of waste in our neighborhood, but how we can make sure that we, they can capitalize that, how they could be a new source of fun for them. So we're thinking uh, because of such situation and how the economy and the market is responding in here, we see the growing numbers, a lot of them, especially the startups, a lot of young people, they come up with a new company trying to make sure they can capitalize the waste in Indonesia. But it's quite spread around between cities and other cities and the way they convert the value of waste it's quite similar with a waste credit, but still in traditional way. We really like to make um, mainstreaming on that, on how, like for example, one kilograms of plastic can be converted into a real currency, but it's only can be converted in a specific platform that is governed and how it can be converted to any other things that is valuable to their life. It's much more simpler if we talk to the community, like for example, if you bring like one glass, one kilo of a plastic, it can be converted to electricity voucher. So we still in a discussion with the regulator on that, on how we can really make sure that it can be converted into something that's valuable. And in the end, Waste is not seen just like a waste, but it could be like a mean for the economic tool. So that is something that we like to do. Flexibility in terms of financial uh, regulation. Thank you so much. And that is uh, that would be really transformative, right? To really value waste to, for, for that to become, in a sense, a currency. And, and I think, Martina, that sort of filters perfectly over to you in terms of that you are also trying to make soil carbon or carbon in trees, uh, something that you can convert as a currency uh, into a value stream to farmers. But what are the regulatory barriers for you shorter term that you would like to see lifted to accelerate this work? Well, at this point in time, there's not a lot of regulatory barriers, but what we do see is that there is a lot of unclarity still in terms of uh, carbon markets, in terms of possible double counting, in terms of to what extent um, uh, carbon that is being sequestered at smallholder level will or will not be counted towards NDCs, so the national commitments of countries. Um, so for us, it would be very helpful if there would be more clarity on that. Um, and, and that is something that we're trying to get more clarity on and, and to um, try to advocate in that, that uh, we need to ensure that there still is a, ver a fair business case for the farmers in all of this. So um, uh, that for us is very important and that's so on the regulatory side, but that's also more the case if we talk about value chains, uh, because you can sell the carbon credits 
uh, on the voluntary carbon market, you could also see if um, uh, the carbon that is being sequestered can be counted towards your scope three. Uh, so then it's in your own value chain, which is great. But still, we think it's very important to then make sure that we clearly look at the business case of the farmers and ensure that the farmers are also then fairly compensated for the work that they do. Um, and that's not always required in guidances like GHG, like SBTI. Um, and, and we hope that that will be the case to really facilitate that the farmers who plant the trees, who maintain the trees, will be compensated for that through the voluntary carbon market or another channel. But in any case, that that is safeguarded, especially when you talk about smallholder farmers. So that is essentially about carbon pricing and how we can support a stronger carbon pricing and fair flow? Yeah, yeah. And it's mostly about a fair flow, right? So that there's traceability of what in the end flows back to the smallholder farmers, ensuring that that is traceable and visible. And uh, ideally also that it's registered so that we avoid a lot of double counting in terms of uh, uh, selling it um, uh, in, in the market, using it for scope three reduction, or using it for the national commit, uh, commitments of country. So to have transparency, registration, and a fair compensation for farmers is something that hopefully will be more clearly stipulated in, in regulations and in guidances. Thank you so much, Martina. And, and over to you, uh, Wang Yang, in terms of, of the same question, uh, you have touched upon sort of new uh, voluntary guidance coming out on, on nature disclosure, etc. But when we look more to the sort of regulatory environment for you to really do what you would like to do, uh, empowering the consumers through your platform, what are some of the shorter term regulatory measures that could support you to do that? Yeah, thank you. I mean, in order for us to be able to uh, perfectly calculate, you know, the carbon or nature footprints of a portfolio, we need full transparent data. So for certain governments, you know, for example, the UK, where there is a very transparent, transparent information sort of um, environment that that works very well. So in fact, we're alive in the UK and, and going strongly. But there are certain other markets uh, where this this kind of for example, a fund doesn't need to disclose its universal holdings. So they only give us top 10. Top 10 doesn't mean anything for us because you could only have about 25% of your portfolio in the top 10 holdings. So if then we can only work with top 10 holdings, we cannot give you a full accurate picture of your carbon footprint or your nature footprint. And if we cannot give you a full picture, then how can we afford you the luxury to switch into a better investment or to offset your carbon footprint, for example? So uh, in this sense, really, I would love to implore all governments to to, to, to mandate disclosure, fair and transparent disclosure, because then it helps our consumers, it gives our consumers better information to then make better decisions. And what are you doing today? Because one thing is disclosures, right? It's, but it's gonna take some time before yes. that really gets into corporate strategy, corporate practices, and then gets to the market. We, we have to wait some years, right? I would yeah. think at least for the niche. So what, what are you also as a platform doing in terms of leveraging alternative data to really get this uh, this data to you to your users yeah i mean we are we are in constant search for for better for better understanding but in the end we we are we're limited by what we can we, we can have so for certain markets we cannot give you full 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 disclosure mm. that's that's the truth and so that's an ongoing conversation to be had with our customers who then need to then make sure that this information is very clearly communicated to the end yeah. investor yeah it's on best 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 case best case basis. Brilliant. And uh, Georgia, uh, the question to you around what are some of the regulatory measures from your broader sort of consumer protection and consumer right in, in, in green finance perspective? Um, what are some of the regulatory measures that needs to happen? What do you see in Brazil? What do you see around the world as some of the regulatory practices you, you, uh, you find important? Thank you, Marianne. So, uh, in terms of collaborative action and regulation, we believe that it's very important to everyone to actually improve the practice as a whole, increase the quality of the financial services the, you already mentioned, and offering and pressing for transpar transparent environmental and social criteria to be adopted by all. 
In that key, carry out a national survey last year and found that almost half of the poorest population could not make financial transactions due to lack of internet access, for example, which is emphasized that we only have accessible finance for everyone when we have improvement situation for the population as a whole. So we often see the international institutions have, for example, high standards in their practice in more developed countries, especially when they operate in markets where people are already more aware of the consequences of investing their savings in projects that exacerbate social and climate issues. However, despite being a globalized world where the issues affect everyone, we see the adoption of global standards when institutions are in the poorest countries. So we believe that initiatives like the one I mentioned from Fair Financial International are essential to customers to make better choices, but also that institutions have great economic power and can lead the transition and set better standards that should apply to all investments and not just the one in the most developed countries after all climate change affect the entire population and also the future generations. Thank you so much, Georgia. Now we've hit the time where I would like to invite any questions from the audience. Uh, feel free to put it in the chat and you can either direct it as a as a general question, I will bring it to the panel, or you can target it at any specific panelist uh, if, if you would like. So um, please do let them come in if you have any questions. And while we are waiting for questions, I would like to turn to a round of, of reflections or advice maybe uh, to we have in the audience quite a number of consumer rights um, professionals. So what do you think, what can consumer rights do in their job to enable you and others to scale green finance and green awareness uh, to, to users? Uh, so any sort of reflections around the importance of consumer rights actions and which types of actions would be valuable uh, to your work? I will start with you, Felix. So could you please repeat the question again? Yes. My uh, connection in, is not stable. No problem. Uh, in the audience, we have quite a, a number of consumer rights professionals that are working with consumer protection and consumer rights advocacy. So um, looking at your work and you're already touched upon sort of some of the enablers as regulation, et cetera, but how can mm. consumer rights, uh, how can they be enablers? Also, what should they advocate for? How can they support? Uh, this work of scaling green awareness and green action that you are working on? What would you need them to, to sort of support you on to move forward? Uh, thanks a lot for the question. I think in, the, in this kind of mode of working, especially when we talk about sustainability, we can no longer separate one stakeholders with another stakeholders, like for example, private company regulators, the community, and also the consumer into like a separate room on that. Everyone should have like a much more, uh, a much more work in terms of collaborative action, one to another, be because every solution is always impact impacting the almost uh, every stakeholders in here. And therefore, uh, I think the customer, of course, have like a bigger voice, especially in the age of such digitalization and have and how they can really make sure that the company is accountable for their effort, especially when doing uh, their thing and with the community and how it can be checked in a very uh, transparent manner. Yeah. Thank you, Felix. And the same to you, Wan Yang. Yeah, sure. So I think when when we talk about consumer rights, somehow we always think about, you know, um, it's, it's more like a protection of our rights. And but we, we should really move from sort of create, we should move from just a matter of compliance to creating a consumer centric innovation model. So instead of just like protecting our rights, but this protection becomes, you know, like a source of innovation uh, fueled by sort of new technologies. So I'm thinking, I don't know, tra traceability systems that can support consumers make purchasing decisions, or collective switching, group buying, that then helps us place purchasing power with companies who do the right thing. Um, any new model of sharing, aggregating, licensing data in common or trust structures that make sure the value of our information stays with us as consumers. These are all potential like sources of innovation that, 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 that you know, advocates can really help us um, build a sustainable marketplace. I really like you're taking an innovative sort of lens on this. I think that's new and that's very refreshing. And 
I remember talking to Via and also at FNZ, telling about how you're also looking at how to use digital platforms to empower people to become partly voters also in company general assemblies on green issues. Uh, I don't yes. know if you would share a bit on that. That is really innovative and quite exciting in this forum. Yeah, absolutely. We we want all of our investors. However, even if you just hold one or two shares, like because you're a shareholder, you have a say. You should take part in the annual general meetings. You should you should always respond to corporate action because that's how you you engage and you you, you become an activist. Um, so we have a feedback loop, loop system built into our our impact tool. It's called Have Your Say. Um, and, and it's basically just, it's, it's a feedback loop system. So you, you, you're, you're making your investments, you're doing your switches, but then you also have a little um, portal where you can input sort of what you would like to see more. Perhaps you, you would like to invest a, according, you know, you would like to support more indigenous rights, but right now this is not an optionality for, and you can tell us, and then we can feed back to the, 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 cli the client. Then you, you feed back also on all corporate actions related to any, any sort of annual general meeting, you know, notes or whatever. But yes, I think a feedback loop, loop system is, is, is very, very important in, in, this, in, this, in this scenario, yeah. Thank you so much, Wan Yang. And over to you, Martine. I guess for you, for you, the consumer in, in some ways is the farmer, right? And and how do you also or, or, or more, I guess as Rabobank, it's much broader. Uh, so the same questions around sort of how can what can consumer rights movements do? And also if you take an innovative lens on it, uh, what, what does that look like? Yeah, so so um, if you look really from, from the carbon market at it, I think uh, what uh, might help, I, I can imagine now for, uh, for a consumer, it's still quite confusing um, when you talk about all of the terminology around net zero, what that means effectively, and um, to what extent then uh, the emission is uh is offset in a way that you think is is fair and is right and to um to, uh, to support farmers in or sorry not farmers but consumers in being able to judge that better i think might help and might ensure that that there is more focus on quality so for example like i said before if we are able to say uh we're certain that once you're looking at certain offsets that quality is higher than others? Or do we ensure that farmers, if, if farmers are involved in the value chain, like I said before, are they paid uh, uh, fairly or not? There's a lot of factors, I think, that are still part of a offsetting or insetting approach that might not be very clear to the, to the consumers and might be very hard to get to the details of it. So if, if um, consumers can be supported uh, on that to to really make the right decisions, I think that would be super helpful. And there's a lot to gain there still, I feel. Thank you, Martina. And I think that definitely reinforces Wan Yang's also that we need to be simple, uh, simplify complexity in order for people to better engage with it and, and just get all the all the terminology out of it and just get what is really needed. Now we we turn to the heart of your work, Georgia, around exactly how can consumer rights movements, really what should be on the top of their job description to enable more people to be empowered with green action and green awareness in digital finance. What, 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 are, your, what are your thoughts, Georgia? Thank you, Marianne. So I think a lot has already been said here. That we believe that we must act together for more transparency and accountability. So today the financial system is global and although most investments are made by the most developed countries, they affect more the countries of the global south that are more vulnerable. So we are talking about a collective action and we have to establish global standards and be able to communicate them. Because information is a matter of availability, but also has to be translated and accessible for all empowered people to push for the regulation and policies improvement. So we think that we also have to invest a lot in communication as well. Thank you so much, Georgia. And then before rounding off, I would like to take a last round and, and really go back to Peter's sharing in the beginning of the vision by Consumers International and where one of the, one of the elements is to make green the default when a consumer enters, whether it's a wealth management platform, for retail, whether it's a mobile payment platform such as Dana, whether it's a bank such as Rabobank, 
so I would like to hear sort of your reflections, Felix. How far are we from, from you and your business model placing the greenness as, a, as the default option when a consumer enters your platform? Over to you, Felix. Uh, thanks a lot for the question. That's really interesting. And I, uh, I do believe, and I think it's also mirroring to the statistics that we have, our consumers in general in Indonesia, the trend is becoming much, much more greener in terms of their preferences in the market on how they doing things like, and we welcome the recent initiative coming from the regulator on the green taxonomy in the finance, and that would uh, create the market to respond uh, accordingly. And in that sense, I think it's just like a matter of time and it's just like a very short, uh, I think, uh, along the way on how private companies uh, respond to that. And there will be a lot of new products in terms of the uh, in terms of uh, green economy and also in sustainability. And I think everyone would definitely go towards that way. It's no longer an option, but it's just like a matter of a priority uh, for their development. Thank you. And over to you, Wan Yang, your reflections on how, how realistic it is to make green sort of the default option on your platform. Uh, I don't think I don't think a default option. It's definitely the goal. I mean, I think we should all go from egocentric investing to conscience, conscience investing. But, you know, um, I, I, I guess coming from nearly two decades in private banking, I'm just quite skeptical. You know, I don't think um, investing investing according to green guilt is something that's sustainable over time therefore there there has to be more user engagement there needs to be a lot of education and i think the answer definitely lies in the next generation um who, you know i think next generations are just naturally a lot more conscious than you know us and, and the ones that come before us who hold most of the wealth as of today um, but i think to make it a default option nobody likes to be told you have to do something so um everyone just needs to be educated and brought along the same way. But I, I, I don't think a default option is, is, is honestly feasible. Thank you so much for challenging that. I think that's, uh, that's very refreshing also, and a good sort of uh, way to put reflections into our head before we close. Martina, a few reflections from you on the default option. Yeah, I, 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 I kind of agree. Unfortunately, I, I feel <laughs> what Wen Ying is saying, but perhaps what I'm what I'm uh, very hopeful of, although I understand that this is super complex, but I, I'd love for more people to push for it is the true pricing initiative, because I think if we really go for true pricing, if we go for um, including uh, the cost of certain um, uh, environmental or social uh, impacts that are now not included, um, that that might help in making the right uh, decisions, because because now um, with that not being the case, can we really ask uh, that from the consumers to make the right decisions? Thank you so much. And, and the last word over to you, Georgia, before we close. Oh, I think uh, a lot has already been said and I tend to agree with you, but I believe that many initiatives are emerging that we can see here. And just the fact that we are discussing these here internationally shows the relevance of the topic for everyone. So I think uh, I started with a more pessimistic uh, view, but I also tend to, to say that I'm pretty happy that at least we are having the discussions and, and exchanging experiences. So I think I tend to finish in an optimistic view. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. And uh, this, this leads us to the almost the end of the hour. So I want to thank all of you for taking the time, both participants and panelists. It's very clear listening to your solutions that there is definitely a growing number of digital tools to help consumers support their green transition, both with awareness, which we heard from Wang Yang should be simplified, of course, rooted in solid information, which we also need the regulators to push for, but simplified so people can engage in it. And also, as we heard on from Felix, we should really put an innovative lens on this. So it's not only about speaking to the moral high ground of people, but it's also incentivizing them by giving their actions real value, whether that is a waste credit, whether that is what Martina is working on, true carbon credits for those who are actually harvesting the carbon on their fields, but are maybe not being rewarded for it 
in the in the manner they should and where Rabobank is trying to bring that transparency and that fairness of flow. Uh, secondly, that there are key barriers that are holding the uptake back um, and that we need robust data, which is definitely one of them. But what we also heard with Martina in carbon markets, which are maturing much more, maybe it's a bit less around regulation now, and maybe it's more about clarity, transparency, standards. Uh, and on the data side, also, if it's around the individual pharma, it's coming together to create one profile, one standard, so we don't have to ask for the same data over and over again and push transaction costs of that down to the user. And that consumer organizations, as we heard Georgia highlight several times today, are here to help and are here to also push for these regulatory pressure, pressures, for these regulatory changes, for this clarity, for this standardization and harmonization of data and regulation that we need. Because as we heard from Wang Yang, there are some jurisdictions like the UK where it's much easier to engage users because the data foundation is actually ready. Whereas in other jurisdictions, this is not the case. And this is where we can create new types of collaborative relationships between the vision we heard Peter talk about today on the ground between consumer rights international uh, professionals and, and the business side that we have here on the panel. So I want to thank everyone. I think we've answered most of the questions. There are a few left unanswered. Uh, so we will make sure to at least attend to them in the reporting from this session. And if you want to revisit the session, then everything will be um, showed on YouTube. So on Consumers International YouTube channel, where you can go in and revisit any of the points or just revisit the whole session. Thank you so much. Yeah, and here you have all you need. Uh, if there are any of the points you want to capture again on the YouTube, or if you want to follow the conversation and the Consumers International work, here are the social media channels. So I want to thank you for attending. This is the end of our panel, uh, but not the end of the discussion and the end of the innovations. Thank you, everyone. Have a good rest of the day.